All right. We're here today with Steve McLeod of Feature Upvote. Howdy, Steve. Hi, Garrett. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, of course. Um, so we'll start off. Can you just talk a little bit about what you do, uh, products, uh, your background, that kind of thing to provide some context? Okay. Well, I run a small software company in Barcelona, Spain. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm not from Spain. I'm from New Zealand. Why I'm here is a whole story in itself, but probably not interesting to too many people today. The software company, our main product, or our main focus today is Feature Upvote, which is a B2B SaaS. It lets your customers openly suggest and upvote improvements to your product. Right on. And so how long have you been working on that? We started in seriousness early last year. It was a small prototype in November 2016. Before that, we were working mainly on a business or a B2C product, a desktop app, which we really wanted to move away from. And that desktop app is more or less what inspired Feature Upvote. Oh, yeah, yeah. Feature Upvote is definitely scratching our own itch. How, and the other app is uh, B2C. So how is Feature mm-hmm. Upvote? <clears throat> how has that been with a B2C audience? Have they actively embraced it and used it? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. No, None of our B2C customers have actually ever commented on Feature Upvote. They use it to make suggestions and upvote suggestions. Nobody's ever written and said, what's this tool or what is this or why are we doing this, which we're really happy about, that idea that people don't even realize that they've been switched to another product, which is what we want to achieve for our for our customers. Right, yeah, because with a technical audience, I can see people obviously embracing it, developers, that kind of thing, love mm-hmm. and always have ideas. Um, but it was interesting to wonder whether a B2C audience would be like, uh, what is this? I'm just going to email you. <clears throat> exactly. And in fact, what we've done is when we get the emails from people saying, can you add this new feature? Can you make this change? We say to them, thanks for the suggestion. Why don't you add it to the, our product suggestion board so that other people can comment on your suggestion and vote it up? And people seem to like that idea. And without any more ado, they just go and do that. Right on. So you kind of hinted at this, but it sounds like Feature Upvote is a path away from B2C. Uh, can you comment a little bit on the motivation, the thinking there, and uh, also at the same time kind of hit on what you've noticed has been different between the two different audiences of B2C and B2B? Sure. So to make sure I've understood uh, the differences were found by moving from a B2C to a B2B product. Okay. First of all, we no longer need to do customer support on weekends. (laughs) That in itself is a huge one. Uh, Business customers typically don't expect to get answers on Saturdays and Sundays. They don't write to us on Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, it's been great getting our weekends back. Uh, the the B two B product is boring. I realize when I'm at a party and people ask me what I do, and I tell them about feature upvote, their eyes tend to glaze over. You can see they're just being polite and keeping the conversation going. Whereas the B two C, well, as soon as people hear about it, they they start telling you about their idea and you know what they tell you about their cousin or their brother who did something similar. So I'm now less interesting at parties. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Have you found it to be um, all the traditional things in terms of payment that it's more reliable, more steady, um, less price sensitivity, that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. In fact, I'm kicking myself for not having moved in this direction uh, years earlier. It's just so much more pleasant uh, where you get a sale. And then that person gives you money the following month and the month after and the month after that. And as long as uh, <clears throat> as long as you don't have anything encouraging churn, it just goes on. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely huge. That was um, with Sifter. That's one of the things I tell people about all the time as I was going through all my health issues that having the recurring revenue was like completely life changing. Like there's no situation that would have been as financially stable as a SaaS business with recurring revenue. Um, so how much time are you spending on this or kind of, how do you split your time and how much total time are you spending each week? Okay. Uh, at risk of offending any of our B2C customers who might listen, I don't think they'll be listening, but just in case, 
Uh, we're not spending very much time on the B2C stuff, but basically it's in life support. We're doing what we need to do to fix bugs and answer customers. Uh, but in all, I work about four to six hours a day. Um, and that's across the whole team. We all work part time. Uh, some people call that a lifestyle business, but has that become a negative phrase, lifestyle business? I think it depends on who you ask, right? Like the people who want to work 100 hours a week and swing for the fences, you know, for them, it's a negative thing. Um, to me, it's a positive thing. That means that, you know, your business isn't running you. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So are, are we making as much money as we could be? No. Are we happy about the uh, the balance of time and lifestyle versus uh, income? Sure. Yeah. So you set a team. Uh, how many people? Uh, what's everybody's role? How's that divvied mm -hmm. up? Okay. We're three people employed and two freelancers. Uh, myself, I do most of the development. We've got a graphic designer, a system administrator, who I got because of your suggestion from your book, actually. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but such as to just go off topic suddenly, that's such a such a thing I'd recommend to anybody is to get a system administrator to help you out from day one. Back on topic, uh, where do I get up to? Oh, so we've got the QA guy who also helps with customer support. And then finally, somebody who's doing a lot of the social media marketing. Now, I've made it sound like we all have clear-cut jobs, but in a small team, we all do a bit of everything. Yeah. So back circling back to the system admin, what have you found? Is there anything specific that you found to be the most beneficial in branching out like that? Oh, yeah. It means that if the system goes down on a Monday morning at 4 a.m., I'm not the only one who uh, knows what to do to keep it going, get it going again. Yeah, now, because my system administrator is paid by the hour because he's a freelancer, he's actually quite happy to be working up at 4 a.m. and earn himself a bit of extra money unexpectedly to get things working again. Yeah, We've gone down twice since we released Feature Upvote to the public in May 2017. And in both cases, my system administrator has been notified of the problem and fixed it before I've even woken up. Yeah, that's what could be what could be better than that? That's huge. And, and admittedly, at least for me, my biggest fear was the cost of it. Um, mm. But as soon as you can financially support it, it is worth its weight in gold. Um, security and updates, all that. Exactly. And he's proactive. The things I wouldn't ever do because like, those things you know you should do, but you don't get around to them <laughs> because you've got a hundred other things to do by yesterday. He's on his list of things to do every month. He knows that on the first of the month, he needs to make sure our database backups are restorable. He knows he needs to check uh, that we're not like nearing the thresholds of our uh, like CPU and so on. Mm -hmm. And you said like worth his weight in gold or worth their weight in gold. We're not paying gold. You don't need to pay <laughs> Silicon Valley rates. And these days, yeah. of, uh, what's the site called? Upwork and mm -hmm. uh, having the whole world available to work. You don't yeah. need to pay those $200 per hour prices that people get in the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and a lot of times, too, um, a lot of those people have their day jobs. And it, for them, it's nice to work with a, you know, a smaller team that's, you know, you can relate to that's more personable. And it's not just constantly putting out enterprise level fires and that sort of thing. So for them, it's kind of a nice way to add some extra income. And, you know, for them, it's not very stressful work because they could do that kind of stuff in their sleep. Uh, yeah, exactly. Whereas me, it would it would take me days to get the right. most basic things set up because I'm not a system administrator. Yeah. I also think, uh, well, at least our guy, I think he really appreciates that he has a lot of um, freedom to make choices about mm -hmm. what products we use uh, and which direction to go. Whereas maybe in a bigger corporation, you get told, like, we are using this product. You must do it like this. Uh, so what's that word? Autonomy. Yeah. He, he has a lot more autonomy. And I think I try to give all my freelancers that autonomy. Yeah, for sure. That makes a big difference, too, that when people care about what they're working on, they don't worry as much about, you know, I don't need to get paid $250 an hour if I'm doing something that's a little fun. I can We can talk about it. There's some wiggle room type of thing there. Exactly. Um, so you're about a year old ish. We're mm -hmm. saying, um, can you talk about customer acquisition in terms of the first customers and kind of where it's evolved to where you're at now and how that's worked for you? 
Okay. Our first customers came kind of personally or through personality, people I knew in person or that I knew from the uh, discussion forum I'm very active on. I think you're familiar with the mm -hmm. bootstrapped.fm discussion forum. Those first customers churned very quickly. Yeah. And then I realized that maybe it's because they were not wholly needing what we had to offer. Then most of our first 10 customers, besides those ones, came from Quora. Is that how you pronounce it? I think so. Quora, Quora. Yeah, yeah. which uh, someone suggested I answer some questions there with the answer that feature upvote is a good answer to the question they had. I was dubious, but man, does that deliver good traffic. Not a lot of traffic, but the traffic it does deliver converts yeah. really well. Yeah, for sure. Well, and there's now, not a lot of products in your space. There's a handful, and the pricing's all over the board. And yeah. <clears throat> I think you'd be surprised at just how many products are in oh, this yeah. space. Okay. I think it's a bit of a darling space of people who can program and want to make a side project or their first product, mm -hmm. but haven't yet realized the realities of marketing. <laughs> so they think they see, they see our big competitor, which is user voice, and they think, well, I can do this in my sleep. Yeah. And they, they do it. It only takes them a few weeks, and they have something to offer, and nobody ever discovers them. Yeah. That sounds about right. Um, so for one of the things I really like to focus on is the pain and the misery because everybody else focuses on <laughs> making lots of money every month and working two hours mm -hmm. a day. Um, but that's really not all it's about, right? There's plenty of other downsides and not to talk people out of it, uh, but to really help people anticipate and be ready for it so that when it does happen, right, when something does mm -hmm. go wrong, uh, people aren't blindsided or they're not beating themselves up about it. And that sort of thing. So we'll start off with a simple. What's the toughest day or event so far um, for you? And kind of how'd you dig yourself out of it? And how'd it go? Okay. I think for feature upvote, we haven't had a day like that yet. I know it's coming, but it hasn't happened yet. But with the B2C software, uh, it was something serving the poker industry. And there was one day in April 2011, in which online poker was shut down in America, out of the blue, without warning, and we lost 55% of our customers, bang, just like that. Wow. Uh, it's hard to keep a positive face or, or even want to keep working on a product when 55% of your business just goes immediately. Yeah. Uh, could you imagine? Uh, did you ever have anything like that with Sifter? Um, I lost eight hours, or well, we had five hours of the data backed up because we only backed up nightly. And so we ended oh. up losing three hours of data. Um, <clears throat> we temporarily lost eight hours. We restored five of those. Um, but for us, and I thought, I was like, oh, great. You know, this was, I want to say, I don't know, it was maybe right after I went full time. It was only a couple years into it. Um, but yeah, it was, I was, I, I assumed we were out of business. I was like, oh, great, we're done. This is it. And I kind of just gave it a shot and tried to save it. And it turned out to not be a big deal. Um, I gave anybody affected a free month. Um, no questions asked, you know, uh, spent a lot of time trying to help people through it, explain to people. Nobody, like, as far as I remember, nobody was even angry. I mean, sure, people were oh, disappointed, wow. but everybody was understanding about it. I mean, I was blown away because i had assumed we were out of business right i mean i was like this is it our reputation's yeah. tanked um uh -huh. and it wasn't a big deal at all in the grand scheme of things i mean it was a stressful week for sure but like yeah. looking back on it now with hindsight it was like you know not that i'm going to be haphazard about database backups in the future if anything now i've like now i'd have a very precise plan and I know exactly what um what to do and not to do but it it turned out to not be that terrible you know i think it was like 700 dollars in in free credits at a time when we were probably i don't know we were probably making five thousand or so a month at that point um wow so i mean it, that's nothing in the grand scheme of things cost wise oh uh, i like that story i hope my customers are as understanding when the day inevitably <clears throat> comes where something goes really bad unexpectedly so when you say 55 percent now is that just short term and they kind of came back or did they just totally jump ship and go use some other product no, uh, they just stopped playing poker. These were on online poker players in America who used our product to track, just to basically do analytics of their playing. And they suddenly couldn't 
couldn't okay. play their hobby anymore, so they had no need of our product. So, yeah, it took years to get back to the. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I was thinking downtime. You're talking about legal changes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. If you re- do you remember a few years ago? Yeah, how there was this big pipe, poker hype in America. Well, it stopped all of a sudden, and uh, yeah. That's, that really affected us. You know, and that's one of those things that it's easy to not think about, but any business is ultimately highly sensitive to legal changes. And oh, yeah. that can really, really, wow. Okay. Man. I think some so, companies have. So was that kind of ultimately kind of some of the impetus to start thinking about moving away from it as well? Or did y'all ultimately recover from that one way or another and manage? I recovered and managed, but it did make me always be thinking of what's next okay. uh, to diversify. Um, it also made me much more careful about building up a war chest, uh, building up a bank account so that we had money to deal with the bad times. And actually, that's been very helpful uh, feature upvote. Excuse me. We've had the money from day one to pay for our um, system administrator to yeah. put in the right infrastructure to uh, to get a security audit done, which cost me a couple of thousand dollars. But I think in these today today's day and age on a SAS, you just can't skip the security yeah. concerns. So on that note, um, do you have a page on the site that uh, just talks about the fact that you've got you've done the security audits and how do you kind of promote that or discuss it? Uh, I know with Sifter, it was one of those things we'd occasionally get technical questions because we were serving a technical audience. Uh, mm-hmm. They wanted some insight on what infrastructure we had in place, what processes we were following, uh, that sort of thing. Is that something you've exposed on the site anywhere, or is that have you gotten questions about that yet? We haven't exposed it on the site. Your question makes me think we should. Wait a moment while I make a note of this. (laughs) Okay. Our audience, I thought they were going to be technical. I thought our customers were going to be, like myself, owners of small software companies. I basically thought we were our target audience. Turns out I was really, really wrong. There's a whole field I didn't even know about called product management. And product managers are the ones who find us and use us. And they t- tend not to be so concerned with what's behind the uh, what's behind the the user interface. They just want it to be easy to use, uh, easy for them to uh, share with their team. Yep. So there's another um, gem in there in that you're not your target audience. Right. We all want to believe that whatever pain we have, if mm-hmm. we have that pain, there must be millions of other people in the world with the same pain. Um, mm-hmm. And often that's not the case. Uh, there might be a subset of people, but nowhere near enough. Um, has that impacted? Have you had to make significant adjustments as you've kind of figured that out? Kind of. It's changed the type of content we're using for marketing, and it's changed the place I'm looking for customers. However, it's been nice. Can in danger of how, how bad language can I use on this? Uh, okay, I'm not going to go too bad. Yeah, let's, Soft, let's keep it keep it, keep it safe. Friendly. Yeah. Okay. Software developers can tend to be jerks, right? Yeah. Uh, so a couple of software people have looked at what we're doing and have told us how that's nothing. They could do the same thing in in two days. Yeah. Uh, whereas product managers, they tend to be much nicer and you know, treat you. They talk to you the way they'd like to be talked to. Right. And I look. I'm a software developer. I've been that jerk often enough. You know, I yeah. guilty as charged. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's tough. Um, and I think product managers, their the nature of their role is to juggle all of the constraints and realities and create the best thing they can given those constraints. And so they totally live in a world of constraints whereas as a developer more on the delivery end of things it's easier to idealize you know screw your constraints let's release the perfect thing uh, mm-hmm. that's that sort of thing so it's easier to to, to get caught up in that i think sure <clears throat> um so at a year in have you had any big plateaus and growth or things where you've had to kind of break through or is it kind of just been one big plateau as you're kind of getting a foothold look each month we've had growth somewhere between 10 and 65%. So I know that plateau is looming um, and we'll need to change our strategy. I've noticed that our growth in organic traffic has started to level off. 
So I'm already thinking ahead about what what I have to do to get through that plateau. I don't know the answer and I'm open to advice from <laughs> yourself or anybody listening. Yeah. Well, I assume you'll be posting in the, the bootstrap forums and we'll all be chiming in at that point. So, um, so what are some reoccurring challenges with either business really that you faced that you've, um, kind of found long-term solutions for either through automation or kind of, um, fixing a leak or, you know, whatever it is, what are those things that every month you feel like you're like, why am I doing this again? Okay. So that's a good question. Something that was unexpected to me, although anybody who's put a text field on the internet probably is familiar <laughs> with this problem, is the scammers and the spammers. Yeah. And look, our traffic went up hundredfold from roughly October to December, or October to January. And while I so wasn't prepared for that, it just got me by surprise. And it was people who thought they could manipulate uh, voting for features by setting up botnets or, or scripts across IP addresses. And we very quickly had to come up with strategies for dealing with that. And meanwhile, like that takes work and that takes time. And at the same time, we're not working on new features, improvements that customers mm -hmm. want. And so to our customers, it might appear that we're doing nothing while we're actually working hard to make the site stable and reliable and usable by everybody. So, you know, I think there's two things to get out of that. One is I think we all worry more about, oh my gosh, I haven't made an update this week. Our customers think we're stagnating and dying and mm -hmm. uh, customers don't care. I mean, they do long-term. Um, but one of the things I realized, Sifter was still growing while, even while I was in the hospital or, you know, laid up in bed and not working on it and just doing support. And it still grew, even though there was no new features for months. Um, and it worked. And I think we worry about that as developers and get caught up and hung up on that more than customers do generally. Um, I mean, of course, everybody likes to see updates. But if you've had a product that's been very lively and it, you know, you skip a few months because you're focused elsewhere, uh, the fallout's not going to be anywhere near what we all, the worst case scenario that we imagine, uh, at least in, from my experience. And the other is, though, that the spam and fraud and all the scams, um, I think that's one of those things that is frustrating because it doesn't stop. Kind of like growth. You hit growth plateaus. Okay. Right? So you progressively start adding layers to restrict that stuff, right? And mm -hmm. then... You're like, all right, I've got it. I put the fire out. And then two or three months later, you get another spike in traffic and get more attention. And then new, more advanced scammers, what have you, start trying to abuse your system. And then you mm -hmm. progressively lock down more. And it's this constant, you know, back and forth kind of cat and mouse game to figure that out. And you end up having to do it. I mean, it's, it's inevitable, right? No matter what your product is, you, mm -hmm. you may be more or less exposed to it, but it's going to happen. And because that was one, I, I had the same thing with credit cards. P people were validating stolen credit card numbers using our form. And at the time, even failed validations, we got hit with the credit card fees. Ouch. Oh, and that so, was pre-Stripe. Yeah, this was Braintree, um, early Braintree. And, uh, you know, it was like $200, which, again, mm -hmm. grand scheme of things, nothing. But I let it consume me for a couple of weeks. And, you know, it's like, it didn't need to, it wasn't really costing us that much money. It was just more the principle. And, um, so I think it's one of those things where it's good for people to know and think about, do what you can keep it minimal, understand that it's going to happen. And then it, when it does happen, you just have to stop what you're doing, handle it, suppress it and move on and not stress about it too much because it's, it's miserable. It's unpleasant work. It's not customer benefiting really not directly. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, that was one of the worst things was dealing with that kind of stuff whenever it happened. So, <clears throat> so it never stops. That's that's interesting to it, know. I'll prepare myself mentally. Exactly, it never stops. It just evolves, and you then progressively need to add more layers to it to help mitigate it. Um, you know, hopefully avoiding captchas, but you know, at some point you may get to the point where you need a captcha or something like that, or you know, there's just so many different strategies depending on the type of spam or fraud or whatever it is. Um, 
but it's one of those things that it caught me off guard. But in hindsight, the more I talk to people, it's a very common, regular occurrence. And it's just part of the deal, you know, just like system administration. Mm -hmm. It's just something that the worst problem is that it happens unexpectedly, right? You can't predict it. You can't mm -hmm. say, I'm going to set aside this week to deal with spam. It's like, oh, the spam's here. I've got to drop what I'm doing and put out this fire. Um, and I think is that's one of those things that just helps people to know it's going to happen. When it does happen, handle it and don't worry too much. Maybe it's even a measure of success. To if a degree, yeah. People, if people are finding you and abusing you like this, it's because your your marketing's working. Like people can find you. They have heard about you. Yeah, and it's it's just growth in general, right? Everybody thinks we all have that. Once I get to this point, things will be good. But mm -hmm. as you grow, you're gonna, you know, your growth and your revenue is improving, but you're also expanding, you've got more customers, you've got more potential problems, there's more risk of downtime. And so with growth comes additional burden as well. And, you know, it's just an ongoing cycle. And I think we all like to think that at some point we'll be able to just sit back and relax, but mm -hmm. there's always something more to be done. And that's just the way it works. That's part of the deal that we signed on for. So the relaxing comes if you ever choose to sell your business, like you sold Sifter, <laughs> that's when you can sit back and relax, right? Go work for somebody else if you want to relax a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Uh, so um, the. Yeah. No, go ahead. So one of the times in which uh, <clears throat> the the abuse of our system caught me unaware was when I was on holiday. Uh, I went down to the southern hemisphere. Um, last winter and my girlfriend and I were in a wonderful beach town in Queensland, Australia. And that's just when we got a warning from our content delivery network in which we serve up images telling us that we had gone way over a threshold and they were shutting down us down unless we paid a lot more money. Mm. And you know, I wanted to just go and sit on the beach and go for a swim and go kayaking. But instead, first I had to fix this yeah. problem. And when you're an employee, your holiday is a holiday. But I think when you're yeah. self-employed, well, especially when you have a product with customers, your holidays are never completely holidays. That's so in, it's very true. And to me, my solution for that was to work fewer daily hours, knowing that even when I do get an official vacation, I'm going to be making up for it then. So mm -hmm. it's almost a, you know, work four day weeks, because even when mm -hmm. you finally get that vacation, you're not really going to get a guaranteed vacation. Anything can happen. Um, and so it helps to go a little easier on yourself day to day and just make up for it on the tail end. When you, when you do have to work those extra hours, you can at least justify it and say, well, I took that day and went kayaking in the middle of the day. So uh -huh. that was our kayaking vacation. Uh, and you kind of stitch together those moments um, and have lots of little mini vacations so that when the stress does come on the, you know, inevitably on the vacation, you at least had some time elsewhere. Um, whereas if you're working hundred hours a week and then you go on a vacation and then you're still working, that's not healthy for anybody. Not at all. Not at all. <clears throat> um, so the, the last two questions are in a way my favorite. Sometimes they open up some great stuff. The first was if you could go back to the very, very, very beginning and give yourself a heads up, this could be mm -hmm. before any product. Um, mm -hmm. what would that heads up be? So like something you would make yourself ready for. Um, or something you could tell yourself, you're going to waste a lot of time on this. Don't bother. It's not worth it. Ignore it entirely. Um, or is there a skill you would have learned? What would that have been? I, my answer is not a not not directly appropriate, but I would say, think really hard about what kind of business you want. If what you want is a business like mine, where I can go kayaking tomorrow. Choose a product and a target audience with that in mind. But if your business is one in which you want to be earning $10 million in five years' time, choose your audience and product. And I think people give themselves a lot of stress by having one target in mind but choosing a product and audience uh, in mind that are just incompatible. Yeah. You'll be familiar with Peldi. In fact, I think Peldi from Balsamic has been on your, uh, on your mm -hmm. podcast before me. And I think he, he – points out, I heard him say in a presentation somewhere how much stress that caused him. He thought balsamic mock-ups or balsamic wireframes, as they now call it, was going to be a one-man business, a one-person business. 
that he would work on and have a nice lifestyle. It turns out that that type of business, its natural size is, I don't know, 25, 30 employees. Mm -hmm. And he had to come to terms with that. And I think that it caused him a lot of painful stress. And I really mean painful stress based yeah. on what he's had to say. The misalignment of expectations, I think, is surprisingly one of the more challenging things, probably with starting any business. Um, you go into it thinking, you know, you hear about everybody that's successful and you go into it thinking this is going to be easy. So many other people have done it. Um, and then you start realizing that it's just a long, slow growth ramp. Um, <laughs> Gail Goodman's uh, talk, the long, slow SAS ramp of death um, with constant contact. Well, everybody's probably not super thrilled or excited to use constant contact because that's not really the technical audience. Like the story is the same. Like it took them a mm -hmm. lot to grow the company and that's just the nature of it. And I think everybody just now expects because there's so many success stories and all the survivorship bias that mm -hmm. it's going to be easy. I'm a developer. I don't need to know how to market and you go into it and it's like, wait a minute, why isn't this just happening? And it can be really off putting, you know, you're like, great, mm -hmm. I poured all this effort into it and it's not working and it just takes time. Um, yeah. That not just time, but uh, consistency. <clears throat> you have to turn up every day, do yeah. something every day. Uh, and that takes motivation when you have very few customers or even no customers. It's hard to make, sure, make yourself motivated to do something every day, uh, which is actually a good argument for getting a first customer as soon as you can, even if you're giving them half price or it's a friend of a friend. As soon as you have someone actually listening to what you're writing and using your products, it's just so much easier to turn up, get in front of the computer by nine o'clock in the morning and work for a few hours every day. Yeah, yeah. Having a customer or a handful of customers and having really, really open channels with them to me was a great way to kind of light a fire because even if you're kind of either you, some days it might just be, you know, analysis paralysis where you've got too many choices. You're like, what should I work on? I need to do this. I need to do that. Um, but if you have customers and the customers are in your ear, they're going to let you know what you need to work on. And okay. while it's not always the perfect thing, the collective consciousness of your customers will help guide you and help kind of light that fire to keep you focused and keep you marching forward, even on the days where it's a struggle or you're exhausted or um, you feel like the business isn't, you know, progressing the way you want. When you just sit there and listen to customers and absorb it and act on that, it tends to work out in the long run. Um, as long as you're, judicious about what you're acting on yeah and which uh, i have to recommend a really good product for helping choose what to listen to it's called feature upvote <laughs> Great. I'm my own product <laughs> yeah absolutely um so the last question and i think we may have already touched on this is if you were starting a new business today and mm -hmm. it, would you do the same type of business or would you talk yourself out of it and go in a different direction and if so why no, I'd be doing the same business and I would have started it years earlier. Specifically yeah. talking about feature upvote as a B2B SaaS, it's, uh, I'm kicking myself. I'm really kicking myself. You know, I, I read people talking about this 10 years ago, how it was the future and all the advantages. And I just made up excuse after excuse. But uh, to know that if I'd started a few years earlier, I'd be a few years further in the journey is, uh, it's, a, it's a regret. For uh, hey. What can you do? For what it's worth and some peace of mind, it was a heck of a lot harder 10 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. That's good to know. You would have been on the uh, bleeding edge at that point. Um, right. The things I see today, and I'm like, man, if I was starting Sifter today, admittedly, there's uh, a lot more apps out there, and it's not quite as easy to just throw something up. And um, But between the monitoring tools, the infrastructure, deployment management, version control, Stripe, right? Mm -hmm. Payment processing, all that stuff, fraud, spam prevention, everything is just leaps and bounds further ahead. And all it is, is just a small monthly fee and the pain just disappears. Yeah. So it's, che it's cheap and it's good. <clears throat> things have definitely improved. The downside is it's a lot more crowded market because it's much easier for people to launch things. So, uh, yeah. but I firmly believe there's enough small corners out there of people that need help and aren't getting it through the, you know, that software could solve their problems. Um, that to me, that's where the most opportunity is now, right? Like you can build developer tools, 
Um, mm-hmm. But that's what we all gravitate towards because that's what we mm-hmm. know. Uh, but there's so many opportunities out there for things to help people who aren't software developers. And oh yeah, that to me is where kind of the next batch of niches is going to be because you find that and you can leverage all this advancement in software tools that all of us software developers have been making and serve those people at a much lower cost, much lower burden. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting opportunity out there in that space. 100% agree. And in fact, I th- Sifter was an example that made me realize that even though we have this very dominant competitor, user voice, mm-hmm. that it was possible. I, I could not believe somebody had managed to make a product in Atlassian Jira space and actually carve out a, an area for themselves. And when I heard that not only had you done it, but had done it well, I realized it just gave me the confidence to know that actually we could do it with feature upvote too. Yeah. We didn't have to be able to compete with them head on for every customer, but we just had to find our own, our own part of the, uh, of the universe and, and do it really well. The big part there is coming back to expectations, right? Like you didn't want mm-hmm. to be, you know, user voice. I didn't want no, to be Atlassian. No. Um, right. And so, you know, and I didn't need $10 million a year to be mm-hmm. happy. Um, and I think that's the key is realizing, and even if maybe you do want to be $10 million a year at some point, start small, mm-hmm. start with something else mm-hmm. that can't necessarily ever get that high and that you know it can't get that high. Build that um, mm-hmm. and then use that as kind of your your runway to build that bigger, more ambitious thing you want to try, right? Instead of diving mm-hmm. right into the really, really ambitious thing right away. Right. <clears throat> you learn a lot just by building anything and taking yeah. customers and receiving money. And just you learn very quickly about the things that are not important, as you touched on earlier, and the things that are important, which are usually not what you expect. Absolutely. All too true. Well, so that wraps up uh, everything I had on my list. Is there anything else, any other last uh, words of advice or words of wisdom you'd want to uh, share with folks who might be thinking about following in uh, this same path? You mentioned Gail Goodman's uh, talk from Business of Software, mm-hmm. this long, slow, SaaS Fast. ramp of death. Yep. Oh, everybody should watch that. If you haven't watched it, find it. It's uh, It's something that really helps you understand the nature of uh, building up a SaaS business, how slow it is, but how once you get it going, it really gets going. Yeah, I'd leave with that. I'd finish on that note. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I'll add that to uh, the show notes too. So, all right. Well, thanks so much for being on. This was fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks. It was all a pleasure. Thanks, Garrett.